In this recording, I'm going to outline a proof of Parsifal's theorem. I will do this for a function f of t with period capital T, and I will use the real Fourier coefficients, not the complex ones. Let's write down the Fourier series for such a function. This is what it looks like. Parseval's theorem is a theorem that tells you something about the integral over a whole period of the square of f of t. Now it may seem like a horrible prospect, but what I'm actually going to do here is take the right hand side, that is the Fourier series for f, and square it. We'll have to, to multiply out the brackets and to begin with, at least, we'll get quite a mess. Squaring out that bracket inside the integral is going to be quite complicated. So I think what I'm going to do is to break it down into three separate terms. The first one is very easy. It's just the square of a0 over 2. Let's do that and perform the integral. There it is. The integrand is just a constant, a0 squared over 4. We get the following. Then it's just a matter of putting in the top and bottom limits to get a0 squared over 4 times capital T. That was the easy bit. Let's next look at the two cross terms. There will be two lots of a0 over 2 times the sum involving the sine and cos terms. Initially it looks like this. We can cancel the pair of 2's at the front then, since a0 is a constant, we can pull it to the front and we can swap the orders of the integral and the sum. So we can take the integration process inside the sum. That means we'll just be integrating sine and cos. That's easy enough. So there are the two integrals we have to do and performing them is just standard integration of sine and cos. Don't forget that sine anti-differentiates to give negative cos. And then, of course, we have to put in the integration limits, 0 to capital T. There it is so far. And, of course, the sine of 0 is 0, so we can cross that term out. And cos of 0 is 1. What about the other pieces? Well, it helps if we remind ourselves what omega, that little thing that looks like W, really is. Remember, it's 2 pi divided by T. So if we cross-multiply, omega times t is 2 pi. Let's erase omega times t in the expression above and replace it with 2 pi. Well, I hope that's made things a lot clearer. Sine of 2n pi, that's a whole number of 2 pi's, is again 0. So I've crossed it out. But also cos of 2n pi, that's a whole number of 2 pi's in the cos, that's the same as cos 0. So that's 1 again. So in that expression, we get 1 minus 1. So in fact, this whole term, the one we call number 2, disappears. That's made life a little easier. Now the really hard bit. Look at that squared integrand again. We've dealt with a0 over 2 all squared, and we've dealt with the two cross terms where the a0 over 2 multiplies the sum. Now we've got to do the integral of the sum times the sum again. In writing this out, we should recognize that the variable n on the sum is what's known as a dummy variable. Each sum carries its own variable, and we should not give it the same name. So when we multiply the two sums together, I'm going to use n for one of them, but m for the other. So there's the first one, and I've got to multiply that by itself, but using a different label, m. So there it is. A pair of sums multiplied together like this can be written as what is known as a double sum. That is, we can put both the summation symbols next to each other and collect all the terms inside, multiplying them together. It'll look like this. Written this way, it suggests that we should multiply out the brackets with the coses and the signs in. I'm also going to pull the integration process through the sums. To save a bit of space here, I've written the sum as a single sum, but indicated that there are both labels to be summed from 1 to infinity. That's just a lazy shorthand version of the double sum. 
Well, this expression looks horrible, but actually the four different integrals here are well known. In fact, it can be shown that since we are integrating over a whole period, the integrals of all these expressions are always zero except for the special case where n and m happen to coincide in value. So for example with cos omega t cos 3 omega t the integral will be zero. With cos 2 omega t cos 7 omega t the integral will be zero. And the same for the other combinations. The only pieces that survive will be when the n and m are the same. In that case we will have cos squared of n omega t and sine squared of n omega t. The mixed things with cos and sine are always zero, even if the n and m are the same. Let's write out that information. So in fact, as we evaluate the integrals of this enormous double sum, almost everything will disappear. The only place where anything will survive is when the labels n and m are the same in the double sum. That means that the double sum will actually just revert to a single sum with the labels the same. We will get the following expression. All through this expression the squares have now appeared because the n and m are the same. So where we had before a n times a m, those are now the same thing. So that's just either a n squared or if I prefer I could still use the label m. It doesn't matter. I've chosen to use n. So a n squared and also the cosines squared because again the labels inside are the same. Now thankfully these are integrals we can do and they turn out not to be zero. If you don't know how to do these integrals I recommend that you look them up and revise them a bit. When you've got a square of a sine or cos you use the double angle formulae. Here's the next step but I'm not going to do it all for you. Suffice to say that when we integrate the cosines here and substitute the limits 0 to t, those pieces of the integral disappear. That leaves the very simple integral to do of just integral 0 to t of a half dt in both cases. The integral of a half of course is just a half t and then we just need to put in the limits 0 to capital T. So finally here's our expression for this last term in this horrible series. And that's term 3 finished. So now we need to put everything together. Do you remember where this started? We were looking at the integral from 0 to capital T of the square of f of t dt. We expanded brackets and broke it up into three terms. Let's go back and remind ourselves what term 1 was. Here it is. It was a0 squared t over 4. Let's write that down at the bottom. What about term 2? Uh, do you remember that came to 0? Let's just check it. Here was the calculation and right at the end I managed to cross everything out. So term 2 doesn't contribute. That leaves term 3 but we've got that now sitting in front of us already. Let's just copy it out. We're nearly there. This is Parseval's theorem except that usually more conventionally people take the capital T and divide it down onto the left hand side so that it doesn't appear on the right at all. Here's the final form. It was a quite a complicated calculation, wasn't it? Nevertheless, it is a very useful theorem. I'll finish there.